Retirement has a lot of moving parts. And if you are a farmer, you need somebody who really understands that industry and the niche that it is in the needs for retirement as well. So today we're gonna to actually sit down with a company called The Retiring Farmer. They specialize in dealing with farmers who are wanting to step away from the business or who are eventually planning to down the road and how to actually plan for that retirement. Now make sure that you stick around to the end of the video so that you can learn how to contact them about some free webinars that they have to offer that'll be coming up pretty soon as well. And if you find this video helpful, be sure to share it with somebody else because I'm sure they could benefit from these webinars as well. So stick around while we talk to the retiring farmer and make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss information on other local businesses around Saskatoon in the future. Hi, I'm Angela the Pearly with EXP Realty and today we are meeting with a company called The Retiring Farmer and my understanding is that you do wealth management, retirement, everything to that effect, correct? Right, we are consider ourselves an integrated financial services company, okay. so we cover anything from the accounting, retirement, for the retirement side of things it's going to be tax planning for succession planning, mm -hmm. as well as any of the investment and sort of insurance needs that uh, farmers sort of find themselves in as they transition from one generation to another. Sounds good. And let's introduce you. Your name is Peter. I'm Peter Hamilton, yeah. Okay. I work here mainly on the investment side of the business, mm -hmm. but I'm, I do a lot of work on the financial planning and the succession planning side of things as well. Nice. So do you work solely with farmers then? No, I wouldn't say we work exclusively with farmers, but that is the bulk of our business and that's the focus of our business as well. We have in-house accountants, like CPAs, that do a lot of the tax planning side of things when you're transitioning a farm from one generation to the next or when you're putting together the sort of the estate planning and the will side of things for, um, for people as they're getting a little older in life. Yeah, it's a good specialty to have, obviously, in Saskatchewan with the amount of farmers that we have, but it's such a distinct business model. Well, yes, like but not. we're not exclusive to Saskatchewan either. We okay. have clients in Edmonton, or sort of in Alberta, mm -hmm. as well as clients in Manitoba. So you could sort of say we are, you know, the, we would consider ourselves a go-to spot for any farmers located in Western Canada. Yeah. Like we're able to cover... Especially these days with the acceptance of sort of teams or online video calls, we're able to cover a lot more, you know, square footage or square mileage, I guess it would be in this part of the world, than, than we were in the past. You know, before okay. you needed a physical location in most places, these days we're able to get a lot more done online. And because a lot of it is, you know, it's work with numbers and data, you can do a lot of the, you know, the document collection and a lot of the a lot of the information can be collected beforehand and it cuts down on the number of meetings you're going to need these days as well. There's not the need for physical documents to be delivered. You can get a lot of that information online these days as well as a lot of those documents can be uploaded from a remote location right onto one of our servers. So it's, we've found that we've been able to increase our footprint just with the increase in the, you know, the adoption of technology by a lot of the farmers that we, our farming clients that we have. Yeah, that's good. Definitely makes a big difference. So, do you happen to know um, where did, I think it's fairly self-explanatory, but how the name was born, how the business was born itself? Yeah, it, it, it stems from the, the history of the business was a, um, start, started as an accounting business supporting farmers and over time transitioned into a financial services company that offered more than just accounting. And then as time moved on and with the demographic changes that we've had in, in, in North America, we're starting to see a situation where there was that, we'll call it the niche required for, uh, for transitioning one a farm, family farms from one generation to the other. Now, the retiring farmer is the marketing name and marketing side of the business, and that's sort of how we came to be with, you know, with regards to what we focus on as, our, as a client. And it is generally a farm or a farming, farmer or farming family that are either in the middle of retirement or starting to do their planning for retirement in the coming years. And the uniqueness that goes along with, you know, <clears throat> today it's very different. If we'd been looking at this a generation ago, it was pretty straightforward. The eldest son stayed on the farm and farmed, and when the parents passed away, the eldest son became the de facto proprietor of that farm. Now it's very different because you have a big dispersion of 
of the next generation in different parts of the country, as well as you have farming and non-farming children that have to be dealt with within your estate planning. Mm -hmm. And that's really what a lot of the challenges are for families these days. It's very easy, or easy is maybe not the right word, it's quite straightforward doing the accounting or the financial planning for farmers, but it's the understanding the nuances of how families interact within that, that planning process is really where you have to add some value. Interesting. Yeah, and, and you'll see that very often where, you know, the farm owners, and I'll always just say the parents, which is, and they can be, they can range in age quite, quite considerably. You know, their big consideration a lot of times when you're dealing with farming and non-farming children is the difference between fair and equitable. You know, they're very, two different words all or fair and equal, maybe let's say. They're two different words altogether, and, and people see it very differently. So those are some of the challenges we deal with quite regularly. And for us, it's trying to structure any of the, you know, the accounting and the tax planning side of things to tie in with any investments that, that are going to be required and how that affects that family's succession. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Do you find there are still a lot of farms staying in the family, or is it getting more common for them to start to transition outside? Um, I would say the natural, t well, yes, they're starting to see a lot more transition outside the family. And the reason for that, regardless of whether people want it or not, is because the size of farms is getting much larger. Whereas, you know, the size of the equipment, the technology that's involved in farming these days allows one farming family or maybe two farming families to cover the same number of farms that might, might have taken 20 in the past. Hmm. So that in itself will just reduce the number of farmers there are out there and technically the number of farms, but it doesn't change the amount of square acreage that's under, under seed at this point in time. Hmm. So you see that and then you also see the situation where that in itself is also led to a lot of the, you know, a lot of the next generation that lived on a farm being able to leave because that labor wasn't necessary. So you have a situation where we will, you know, we have that situation where we'll have um, a farm owned by the older generation that now has no children that want a farm at all. And it's really just a romantic sort of um, tie to the land that keeps anybody still out, out on, on, on the farm. And in a lot of cases, they may just keep the home quarter or the homestead mm -hmm. and sell off the rest of the land, but still want to remain out in that part of the part of the country because a lot of people are very attached to it. Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. So the, the, it, every family is unique, but the trend would say that, yes, we are seeing a situation and this has been going on in a lot of, a lot of businesses. Technology is, you know, farming is not unique. They're being affected by technology just as much as everybody else's. And, and you're, you're seeing larger farms bigger direction towards what we'll call it corporate farming, which is, you know, maybe a misnomer, but like most farm, a lot of farms are incorporated these days, but they're now have the technology and the requirements to run a farm very much like a corporation because of the amount of, you know, the amount of property under, like the, the, the amount of land is worth millions and millions of dollars these days. So it's not an insignificant asset that has to be, you have to have a steward of that asset. Yeah. And then the amount of equipment that it takes to run a large farm is not insignificant either. Mm -hmm. And then, as every farmer will tell you, their biggest concern is always battling Mother Nature and the, uh, the reality of crop insurance and praying for rain at the right time and, and hoping for a good crop. So they, they have to take things very seriously. And I, I don't mean to make light of this, but you'll see, a, you know, we'll have a client show up, you know, drives up in a pickup truck looking like a regular farmer and and listen to the sophistication of how they run the risk management on their businesses these days is quite impressive. They understand. Yes. Yeah, well, they, yes. they have to understand that. And these are, you know, the, the, just the nature of farming requires you oftentimes to forward sell some of your grain before it's even been, been harvested or understanding how you might want to hold on to some of that grain. So they're really, in that case, they're commodity traders. They're managing that asset after it's come out of the ground for them which is, you know, it's quite a sophisticated process in a lot of cases. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I grew up on a grain farm. Okay. I remember watching a lot of that happen. Well, no, like, like you'd see it, and, but, but like you've seen the, you've seen over time how things have sophisticated, or sorry, how the processes have become much more sophisticated 
and the requirements for that farmer to understand something that they must might have just done naturally in the past and how that's affect or how it's tied into financial markets around the world because our you know what we produce ends up all over the world right now and exactly. you know and and they you know any farmer has to have a good handle on where where and when they're going to sell their their grain or how they're going to insure themselves against crop loss mm -hmm. yeah exactly and even the simple fact of it being they're being self-employed you they know are, and so it's a different element of planning for retirement planning for that you know being done they don't have that pension to rely on and everything else no and you're absolutely correct there it, it's it's a different mindset from them but you know they've put this equity into the business which is the farm mm -hmm. and it, although it has a huge fixed asset that can't be picked up and moved anywhere it still is that's where all their equity lies and there has to be some understanding and a plan in place that allows them to transition that equity out of the farm and out of that asset to provide for them or their families and the other thing you're finding these days this is a lot of a lot of people in all types of businesses that have been successful or have some assets put aside want to start transitioning that to their children and their grandchildren so they can see it while they're still alive versus what the traditional way was well the day I die that's when you can have access to what's <laughs> left sort of thing but you no know, but it, but for a lot of and I really don't want like a lot of our clients the words words not simple but they have very um, they don't have a large drain on their assets in a lot of cases. They really, a lot of them, as I said, still have a very, very ingrained attachment to the land. So they're not looking at buying a million dollar boat and floating around the Caribbean. They still like to go to their grandkids' hockey games and, you know, go have coffee at the coffee shop every Sunday morning. And they're realizing now that they have that ability, which they might not have thought they did 10 or 20 years ago, to be able to pass on assets to their children while they're still alive and while they're still able to enjoy them. That's pretty wild. That's good. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's just, it, it's change in mindset. And yeah. when you see somebody, once they're kind of looking at the numbers and you do the classic, how much do you need to retire? And like, it, once you run, like I said before, running through the numbers is a very straightforward process. It's having the discussions that you really need to have that generally will take part with the, with the family when we're not around and then they'll come back and we'll discuss things again but you can see where oftentimes you become a I don't call it a family counselor and then and, and you're answering them questions that they're they have in their minds what they'd like to see happen they're just trying to understand how they can make it happen and what sort of timeline they can make it happen on. That makes sense. Yeah. So in a situation like that so if somebody was wanting to come and see you guys sit mm -hmm. down and go through all these sorts of things. Are there certain conversations they should start to have with family that could maybe get the process moving for them on that end? Yeah, I think, you know, there's no perfect conversation, but I think just having any conversation is a good good idea. And, you know, we'll, you know, I've seen it. I've, you know, you'll sit down with the farm owners, the patriarch and matriarch, and you'll see the, the children and things will come up during those conversations that no one really knew about whether you know someone who might be working on the farm really doesn't like working on the farm or someone who's been away from the farm in the big city or wherever they may have been may be thinking yeah i'd really like to come back or you know i i'm sick of working in you know sort of sick of being a roughneck or working up north or whatever it may be and i think i'd like to give them a, give it a shot at farming and that those are the sort of conversations that are that's family specific, like like it's everyone, um, you know, putting their cards on the table really on how they feel, not necessarily on how things have to be mm -hmm. kind of thing. And I've seen situations where, you know, this one, you know, is always quite interesting, but it's, you know, where there might be a daughter in the family and, you know, the parents are thinking, oh, she's got no interest in farming. And then it turns out that there's two or three grandkids that are involved that are interested in being farmers. Like I've seen, you know, granddaughters and grandsons really interested in being back on the farm, whereas it skipped a generation from them, but they always enjoyed going out and visiting grandma and grandpa out on the farm or spending summers out on the farm. And if you'd grown up on a farm, you know, that's a nice time to be out on a farm yeah. during the summer. So, you know, they, they all of a sudden are maybe interested in being considered as part mm -hmm. of the conversation, which may stop 
the farmland from being sold, or it may be looked at as a very, very different structure moving forward. And, you know, we'll find situations where, yes, the farmland stays within the family, but it just gets restructured a different way, where it's no longer a sole proprietorship. Now it becomes much more, as you mentioned before, it's structured as a corporation with shareholders. And some may be active shareholders, as, as in they're actually out on the farm, and there might be silent shareholders. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, just, it's just good at this stage, financial planning mm -hmm. for the farm to get structured in such a way that the next generation understands the plan. And the plan might not be tomorrow. It might be, dad doesn't want to retire f for five years, and then he only wants to work during, during a harvest. He likes being out run, running a combine for a couple weeks at a time. And then that transition may come completely at that point in time. And they'll always live out on the, on the homestead, but they don't have any plan of moving into the city. And, and to be honest, like most, most decisions made for moving in the city are made for two reasons. It's being close to a hospital, yeah. being close to grandkids. Yeah. So I want to spend more time with my grandkids and it's becoming a bit of an issue having to drive into the hospital every time you need, a, need to go see a doctor kind of stuff. And that, those are sort of the transitions that are, those are the discussions that are good to happen, mm -hmm. you know, ahead of time. And that's where it's always easier to do the planning versus being forced to do things on a for, forced by oftentimes health reasons to actually make finally make a decision. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's no different than anybody. But it's you know farmers are hardy people. They think mm -hmm. they're indestructible. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Actually, it's in their nature. It, it, it is, and I you know I, I can't I can't fault them for that. Yeah. But but like everybody you know everybody gets a little older. It might be ten years later for them, but like they're they'll eventually get there too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So if somebody, say you've got somebody new <clears throat> who's taking over the farm or anything else, when is the best time to sit down with someone like yourself and just start to get everything in order and plan? Like a lot of people, I'm assuming, leave it yeah. till the end, but... So the process we sort of follow is we'll get, you know, that curiosity call or can you give us a call? Like we'll, and that to us is, you know, you know, a prospective client. And what we'll start by doing is that's just putting together a profile of the client and I'll tell them this, it usually takes, you know, about an hour to have a conversation. And I tell them it's, you talk about your farm, you talk about your family, you talk about your finances, and you talk about your future plans. Mm -hmm. You get that sort of down and then, you know, that's all really pretty straightforward. That's just nuts and bolts and there's no, no opinions that need to happen at that point in time. It's just information, information gathering. Mm -hmm. Then we'll talk through things with, you know, with our tax planners or that that's usually the first step that anybody's going to have mm -hmm. to really see if there's work that needs to be done today or, you know, you know, one of the questions I'll ask every single prospect is, do you have wills in place? Mm -hmm. If they don't have wills in place, it'll be, go put your wills in place before we'll even talk to you because that's going to cover a lot of the discussions that we've talked about mm -hmm. and it puts you in a situation where you know things are already considered and they're already in place so that there, if there ever is a problem, after you've set out your plan, that's that's been covered already in your discussions, mm -hmm. and then you'll do an assessment and sort of say, yeah, this is where this is what we could do. This is how we could do it. It's going to depend on what your plans are. And, you know, some people will put a plan in place. I, we've I've seen clients that have put a plan in place and intend to farm for another decade, and a couple of years later, we'll get a call and it's I've had enough. Time to <laughs> time to sell. But, time to modify. <laughs> but, but 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 you're but. You're right. You're modifying a plan instead of making a plan at that point in time. And if you've put a plan in place, you'll have that flexibility where you don't have to say, oh, I wish we'd done that three or four years ago. You can now say, well, we've got this plan and that was always one of the options, yeah. but we ex we did, we're expecting that 10 years from now. Gotcha. So maybe we'll just have to accelerate that by a couple of years and sort of move from that, that point forward. Okay. Well, that makes sense for sure. Yeah. It, it, everything's always going to... With any... Any professional, you're always going to have to start with a conversation at mm -hmm. some point in time. And they're going to be able to tell you, they should be able to quickly tell you whether or not you need their services or not, or what services you may need. We're fortunate in the sense that we can provide and have a good handle on a lot of different, a lot of different considerations that, you know, a farmer would be running into or anybody, any small business owner selling their business would be running into. Yeah. And where we don't have expertise, you know, tax lawyers, we have, you know, have good relationships with lawyers that we can call in when we need to and 
they can address those sort of issues that we have or that the clients may need need on the legal side of things. And that, that's all, once again, although they're not in-house, it's more of an integrated team approach. So, mm -hmm. you know, they know what we're doing and we know what they're doing. You've got people you trust. And yeah, and I think, you know, most people will say that, but it, it's always a good thing to be able to, you know, our, our discuss, discussions is always, do you have a lawyer you like or do you have, like, who are you working with at the moment? And some yeah. people will be, you know, these are my professionals and I like this one and this one's okay and this one's probably should have retired 10 years ago sort of yeah. thing. And we'll generally find ourselves into a situation where we can work with the existing team or if, if there's a requirement to replace some of the parts, we'll do that as well. If mm -hmm. there's conflicts, we'll be able to work around that as well and those pop up all the time. Mm -hmm. So what about the investment side of things? If somebody had... Yeah. I mean, obviously, they've got extra money and they want to know what to do with it. Is that something you guys handle as well? We handle that as well. Okay. And, you know, we're, we'll generally try to integrate that into our planning as well. You know, it's not, not absolute, but we'll find that after the relationship has developed, if, you know, they'll eventually get things consolidated in one place. And especially when we have a situation where you're going to have a large... Uh, if, if uh, you know, if that farmer decides once again to sell the farmland, then once again, you're going to be left with a very large asset and will be, most of the time, the focus is on structuring that for a tax efficient sale. And then once those assets have been generated, well, that, that'll be part of the plan as well. So we're always going to be looking at how the uh, assets will be replacing that family's income on that side of things mm -hmm. you know because you want to find yourself in a situation now i'm not old enough but to know this but but you know you always want to ensure and that this is you know one of the sad realities of life is that you know the person who owned that property that was and as i mentioned decades and generations ago it was always the oldest oldest son just stayed on the on the farm and then took it over but really, mom and dad died on the farm as well. But nowadays, you know, they're like, they're trying to retire like most people are a little earlier so they can still enjoy what's going on. So you have to make sure there's considerations in place for if that asset is transferred from what? That's mine. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, if that asset is transferred from one generation to the other that no one's left. And as some of my clients like to say, in the poorhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Fair which, yeah. which, which, which is, is, which is a very rare situation, but you know, you want to be that those are sort of the discussions that need to take place. Like, mm -hmm. and, and who, who works the land versus who owns the land is also very different in a lot of cases as well. And now those are, but as you, you know, asked earlier, what are the discussions you need to have? Those are all parts of it. It's mm -hmm. sort of, it's, it, yeah, you have meant, you eventually may get the farm, but you know, until then we might still run it as a corporation and. You know, everyone needs to make sure they're covered as far as like the assets or the income stream that's generated off that asset. Yeah. You know, whether it's rental, whether it's, you know, whether it's custom farming, you know, you have a lot of situations, just depending on the part of the country you're in, where there's oil and gas leases on the property as well and producing wells. And that, that's another income stream that always has to be considered. Yeah. So that, that's the, the, like everybody is different, but the, conversations tend to always sort of be the same. It's sort of like, who's going to who's gonna run the farm? Who's going to take over the farm? What are we going to do to address farming versus non-farming children? And I really want to make sure my my grandkids are well taken care of. I want to spend some time with them. It's not fun to take them to Disneyland kind of stuff. Yeah. And those are that's what we're finding a lot of people want to do these days, is really spend that time while they still can mm -hmm. and enjoy their, their grandkids when they're younger spend time with their family. Yeah, exactly. Have you found there's been more of a shift in the last couple of years yeah. with well, everything I, going on? Like I, say, I think once again, as I mentioned, like the demographics is what's driving a lot of things. Like there is a large group of farmers in Canada and, and in the U.S. that are all over 60 and over yeah. 70. And it, it's, you know, they that's what's driving a lot of these changes for them. Yeah. It's and, and we've had a huge increase in the value of farmland in the past decade. So you put those two factors together and all of a sudden there's options available that weren't there a decade ago. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of farming wives that are <laughs> want to be spend a little bit more time with their grandkids that are in, in the... Uh, in the city, so yeah, you know, you're seeing you're just you're, 
it, there's no one size that fits all, but you're starting to see the general trend would, would move towards that. But I think mm -hmm. this would just be just based on the demographics when you're going to see a lot of these farm transitions taking place or and a lot of the planning for it as well. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Well, and the fact that you guys specialize in it, you've seen a lot of the different scenarios, so you can kind of help people work through what could be coming up that they might not have even thought of. No, and that's really a, a fair comment. Like, you'll sit down, ask a bunch of questions when they think they've got everything nailed down, and, and then it's you'll hear the, oh, I never thought of that. Oh, maybe that is something we should have. Con I'll, you know, I'll, good, a good example of that I'll use is people pick, picking an executor for their will, you know, you will talk to somebody who's 60 and they'll say, oh yeah, my friend is going to take care of it for me. And I'll say, well, how long old are you planning to be when you die? And they'll say, well, oh, I'm healthy. I'll live till I'm 85. And I'll say, well, your executor is going to be 85 at that point as well. And if you had that discussion with them as to whether or not they're going to be comfortable dealing with a lot of these issues, and it's, oh, you're right. Because we are planning for the future and we are, Everyone is still human when it comes to a lot of things. And when you, you may feel it's great that, you know, my friend or my cousin can handle things versus saying, is that really what's going to be best for my friend or cousin when the time comes? Do I really want to put, do I want to put that pressure on my sister or brother who may be grieving when the time comes? And that seems to, we see that, I see that quite often, which I always find very heartbreaking is, you know, a husband will die and he'll make his wife the executor and she's distraught yeah. and now all of a sudden she's had all this financial mumbo jumbo piled on top of her which is really not what she wants to be dealing with at that point in time which is mm -hmm. and it's not bad planning it's just kind of you know I don't think a lot of people appreciate the complexity that's sort of had, as things have changed over time like, like how much it's required to, to do certain things at, at, at yeah, what time were really quite simple it was like you just went down and saw your local banker who knew who you were and he just, you know, changed the name on the account and off you went. That yeah. was, was all really tough yeah, at that point exactly. in time. And, you know, and, and, you know, it didn't matter because, you know, the, the son was taking over the farm and there wasn't any really any requirements to register land title changes or any of that sort of thing. But those things have all changed. And as we said, things have got a lot more complex and that's why the planning done well in advance is usually the best planning that everyone can do. Oh, I don't need that now. Well, you're right, but you're you got the capacity to take care of it right now. And once it's done, you don't have oh, dad's in the hospital and everyone's searching around trying to find you know his last tax return and it's locked up in a safe that no one knows the combination to. <laughs> or we throw, or we think there's a safe. Yeah, that's an we even don't know where well, that's an even better one. I've had that one. We think there's a safe and we're searching for it right now. And I'm like, okay, well. <laughs> Start digging up behind the barn and tell me what you find, kind yeah. of stuff. And that, and that, it's it's silly to laugh at it, but it's the reality in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody wanted to get in touch with you guys, they can just call or email. Call or email. Yeah, it's the okay. retiringfarmer.com. We're online. You, they can fill out a an informational uh, page there. They can give us a call directly. You know, we'll have someone reach out back to them. We run a webinar series every fall and spring. So that starts up in November. So we run that over the winter. They can sign up for those. They sign up for those is on our website. So, you know, they don't even have to call us if they don't want. They can just start watching the webinars and they'll get a good introduction of of what we do and how we do it. And some of the things we've talked about will be covered in those those webinars. So you'll be able to, you know, sit back in the comfort of your own kitchen and have a coffee and they run in the mornings and, you know, they can watch those when there's lots of snow on the ground and no one wants to go outside. But that will give them a good uh, way to interact with us without having to, you know, make any... Uh, there's no commitment on their part to even talk to us, but that's a good good introduction, I think, to get a good handle on and the thing you talked about earlier, what are the conversations to have. Those webinars will cover a lot of things we should talk about. like. What are things that might come up in the transition? What do we really need to do? Have I done a lot of this myself? Like, you know, they, you know, find a lot of people over, you know, the, oh, we've got our wills in place. They kind of know where they want to go. They're sort of trying to figure out what their options are. And for most people, I think that's what it always is, is understanding what their options are and fitting that together with what their family circumstances are. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Good. 
So is there anything that you think we should touch on that we missed at all with the business? No, I think I think that's good. Um, yeah, I, I like f from my perspective, like you know, there is no commitment to. Mm -hmm. you know, please edit this out. Yeah. <laughs> We just don't like tire kickers, like like, no, like yeah, like so. Like when I say we do a we do a profile of people, it's mm -hmm. really to determine if they're tire kicking or not, yep. right? And it's to get a good idea of really if they're in need of some higher level tax planning and mm -hmm. whether they do have any identifiable liabilities that they should really consider, you know. And on the liability side, it's usually. You know, are you going to have a big tax bill if you're not careful? And how are you going to manage? Yeah. You know, one of the issues with farmers is there is very unique um, tax code that applies to them, but they have to make sure they're what we call on side with that tax code. So if you're on side, it's in your favor. Once you get off side, you're just treated like everybody else. So, gotcha. and one of the things that's happened back to this whole demographic thing is you've seen a lot of farms build up a lot of cash within them because farmers are absolutely unwilling to pay one penny more tax than they have to. <laughs> so you know, you'll find this situation where they build up all this cash within their corporations and that puts them offside, even though it's a farm. And, mm. and once you're offside, as far as CRA is concerned, you can't roll your farm over to your children tax-free. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So they're okay. So when, when I say structuring and the plan so yeah. like like this is kind of what you'll see happen and i didn't want to just generalize when we were talking you'll see you know once again dad's getting a bit older mm -hmm. but these old buggers are in good shape but you know there's plenty of grandkids now and he's not quite ready to leave farming and he's not quite ready to hand it over to whoever's working on the farm right now but Back to the size of the farms too, what we'll see happen is there's dad on the original farm and he's got some leased land from one of the old neighbors and one or two of the kids, whether it be son and daughter, like whatever the, the, that group of kids is, they've got their own land and everybody farms as one big collective. Mm -hmm. you know, they share, you know, they share equipment, they share time, they share plans as far as rotating crops and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So they, it's, it's really just one one farm to them, but it's they've got rented land, some owned individually. We'll see situations. Perfect example will be, you know, the wife got uh, land from her parents. You know, husband got land from his parents, and there's they own some that they bought back in the '80s jointly. Got a bunch of quarters that are sitting in a farm a corporation somewhere. Like everything's all over the place, kind of stuff, and that's when the plans start for okay. You know, this is going to take us five years to consolidate equipment, get it into, let's say, an operating company and a land co. And however you're going to deal with that, as well as cleansing any cash out of the corporation, so the corporation looks like a farm to CRA. Gotcha. It's a farm corporation to them versus just any other small business kind of stuff. And when you're looking, when you look like a farm business to CRA, then you're able to take advantage of some of the tax code that doesn't exist for other businesses. Yeah. And the same thing goes with, oh, and so then what you'll see is all of a sudden, dad will now rent all the land, maybe to this, to the other kids, it may be to the neighbors, whoever it may be. He'll go on for, you know, 10 years living out there in the summer while they live in, you know, Phoenix or wherever it may be in the winter. Get, they'll get in their fifth wheel and go to Arizona yeah. or something like that. <laughs> I, I was trying to think of a good way to say, yeah, like not saying farmers are simple people, but saying they just don't have, like the, the lifestyle they live is really quite, has generally speaking without health concerns, mm -hmm. doesn't require a lot of cash. And that's flow. not a bad thing. Uh, no, it's not yeah. a bad thing at all. But yeah. like, like that's what I'm saying. All of a sudden they've found themselves with, oh, I've got, you know, $5 million worth of farmland here. And, you know, well, I've got plenty of savings. Like they're, what am I going to do with this yeah. kind of stuff? Yeah. Like, like how? What, and when you say to them, "Oh, you know, yeah, you could sell that farmland tomorrow, and you know, we can, you know, get you, you know, get you equity, get you a target return of X, Y, Z," and all of a sudden they're looking at more cash flow than they'd ever possibly need. But they're still very, you know, and I can understand this very emotionally attached to that pro that land because they've got all their sweat and in it, sweat and blood in it. So, mm -hmm. so you'll see 
you'll see this kind of, and then like I was saying, you'll see this transition where we'll do the planning, you know, dad will be, oh, I'll work, I'm going to work for another 10 years, or I'm going to rent it for another 10 years. And then after a couple of years, they'll be like, yeah, you know, it's time's come. Like, like, and then that's exactly what they'll say. We'll, we'll get a call that says, time's come. You know, I've been renting it to my neighbor. And it's funny, really what they're doing is they're renting it to see if the guy that they're going to sell it to takes care of it. Oh, I suppose. Yes. I, like, I hear it all. Oh, I like the way this guy farms. So they'll <laughs> custom farm with him for a couple of years. Then they'll rent it to them and then yeah. they'll be comfortable that the next steward is going to take care of their baby. Yes. And then, oh, yeah, I'm good. Are you going to find it? Oh, I got a buyer. We've already agreed on a price. Oh, okay. Like, like <laughs> oh yeah, we've been talking for years kind of stuff. And I know what the property sells for. So that's sort of this transition that a lot of them are taking. And that's the, that's the human side of it. It's, it's a situation where... They kind of know what they want to do. They're just not 100% sure what the timeline is going to be. So if they've got that plan in place, they are comfortable pulling the trigger on their timeline. And the same goes with, oh, you know, yeah, we're, we bought a condo in town. We're spending more time here close to the grandkids. And we're all going to, like I said, we're all going, all going to go to Disneyland this year or Hawaii or whatever it works out to be. And that's, that's what you're starting to see a lot more of. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's going to change the landscape of the rural communities in Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba, but that's you can't can't change that now. No, nope. like that's nope. just the way it's moving. Exactly, things are always changing. They are. Yeah. No, well, that's very interesting. It's good. So I really appreciate your time today. Oh, no problem. Lots of learning, but yeah, I think that's one of the big takeaways that I had there for anyone who's curious about it, I think that first step would be great to hop on those webinars. That's a really good first step, right? Like there's yeah. no commitment to that. There's, you know, you'll, you can see all the topics ahead of schedule. So if you're, if there's a topic that catches your interest, make sure you're registered for that and you're there for that. And, you know, it gives you the opportunity to gather a bunch of information on your own time. And that oftentimes will facilitate those conversations we were talking about that take place within the family. Mm -hmm. And it gives everybody that opportunity to say how they feel versus, you know, dad and mom making plans and telling everybody what's gonna happen because, you know, it's a, people's, people's interests change and people's life circumstances change as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's really what you want as a plan that allows you that flexibility to adjust to any changes in your life circumstances. There you go. Yeah. And starting early allows you the flexibility more so because you get those basics. In place. You're, you're absolutely right. And it, and it gives you, like, you might not think it's really important early on, but once you have those structures in place, you're always able to change change things if need be. Like, mm -hmm. There's nothing saying it has to stay the way it is. It's, it's like any good plan. You set it in place, you review it to see if it's still good and it still makes sense, and then you can just kind of always move on on that sort of situation. That sounds good. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you too. That was great. Yes. Thanks for sticking around and for watching right to the end. I really appreciate it. Now, make sure that you check out the webinars that they have. If you've missed one, I know that they repeat them. They've got more coming up. And hit subscribe on my videos here if you'd like to keep kept in the loop on other different companies that are around Saskatoon, different businesses that can definitely help you out. And I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. I'm Angela.